Hello everyone and welcome back to One Civil Law where we learn through the misfortunes of others. For today's video, we are beginning a series of videos in which we will explore the question of whether or not Donald Trump, and for that matter, any president, enjoys official immunity, absolute immunity, for their official acts committed while in office. So the president does things within the capacity of being present. So this question does not deal with whether to the extent he is not acting as president. So if he's not acting as president, then that is not the question we're trying to solve right now. So it's completely possible that the person who happens to be president may not be acting in the capacity of the office of the president. There are two distinct concepts there, right? Just because there's a distinction between the man and the office. The man can do things that just the man can do. The office can do things that the office can do, and these are not necessarily the same. So for today's question, we're not trying to solve whether or not Trump can be held responsible for acts that are outside of his office. That's an entirely separate question. We're trying to deal with the premise that we're dealing with acts that are within his office. These are acts of the president. These are official acts. And the question is, can the president be held liable for that, either civilly or criminally? And the answer to typically has been no, absolute immunity for any official acts. The president enjoys absolute immunity, which is not a unique concept in law. This is also a concept that is applied to judges, for example, and to prosecutors, for example, that they cannot be held responsible for their official acts within the bounds of their office. And so to would be the president as well. But this, of course, is a controversial conclusion. So the Supreme Court is trying to decide this issue. Does the president enjoy this absolute, total, complete immunity for acts that are, in fact, within the bounds of his office? So to, to start answering that question, we are going to turn our attention first to the brief of Donald Trump. I should note, by the way, that the briefs from the opponents are not yet available. So for the next couple episodes in our series, we'll be discussing the briefs that are in support of the proposition. The briefs against the proposition are not yet available. They have more time to respond. So for the next couple of days, at least, we'll just be discussing the arguments in favor and critiquing the arguments in favor. So let's see what Donald Trump has to say on this important question. The question presented formally is thus, whether, and if so, to what extent, does a former president enjoy presidential immunity from criminal prosecution for conduct alleged to involve official acts during the tenure of office? Again, these are official acts. That's the premise. If these are not official acts, that this question does not deal with that. So Donald Trump, to the extent he did things outside the, the confines of his office, this question does not even attempt to deal with that. We are assuming, for the sake of argument, these are acts that are within his office, whatever they happen to be. It doesn't really matter for our points of our analysis, but whatever they are, they are definitionally within the confines of his office. Does he enjoy immunity for that? That is the question presented. All right. And then we go through, you know, the standard things, the headers, table of contents, all the wonderful authority that gets cited from various case law, you know, constitutional provisions, other authority. And we get into an opinion which is provided below, jurisdictional statement, which we don't need. All right, so now we get into the merits <coughs> of the thing. All right, let's see what we got. From 17, 1789 to 2023, no former or current president has faced criminal charges for his official acts for good reasons. The president cannot function, the presidency itself cannot retain its vital independence if the president faces criminal prosecution for official acts once he leaves office. The president's personal vulnerability to such prosecution would inevitably distort the presidential decision-making process with respect to official acts. A denial of criminal immunity would incapacitate every future president with de facto blackmail and extortion while in office and condemn him to years of post-office trauma at the hands of political opponents. I mean, this is sort of the downside of this thing because this is sort of the twin parade of horribles that are presented by this case. So if the president doesn't enjoy immunity, the problem with that is, well, then he doesn't enjoy immunity and presumably can be held liable for any violation of any federal law, and there's a lot of that, and might be held liable for any violation of any state law to which there's a jurisdictional nexus because he doesn't have immunity. 
So maybe he can be held responsible for state law too. The problem with that is, of course, we wind up in a situation where every president will be indicted. It's a certainty because there's just no way. You can't, you can't do it. You can't get through four years of your career without finding something that someone can complain about you know, in a, in a way that's criminal, as, as people might be motivated to bring charges. So whatever the merits of this case against Trump can be said, right, as we're trying to decide this is a legal proposition, we have to not only be concerned with the confines of this case, but of course all future cases, because that's the nature of what the Supreme Court does. They send out legal principles. So whatever you might believe as to what Donald Trump did or did not do, or the merits as to the le legal prosecution there or there too, whatever answer you give would necessarily impact every future president. And it's a little bit hard to see how you just don't wind up in a situation where every president is endlessly indicted forever. So it, it, it does wind up in nightmare fuel. Of course, the contra, the, the opposition to that, the other side of that equation winds up in its own set of problems. If the president can't be held held responsible, then he might be able to do things that are just flat out criminal, but are within the official acts, and maybe that's maybe there's no way to prosecute him. So none of these answers are particularly great, but yes, the president does seem correct. There would be a sense of de facto blackmail, and we wind up in a situation where every former president is prosecuted, something like South Korea or any other number of countries where that kind of thing has happened. So it could lead to a whole paradox of problems. The threat of future prosecution and imprisonment would become a political cudgel to influence the most sensitive and controversial decisions, taking away the strength, authority, and decisiveness of the presidency. The D.C. ruling, if allowed to stand, deeply wounds the president by substantially reducing the president's ability to protect himself. A president's criminal immunity arises directly from the executive vesting clause and the separation of powers. In Marbury v. Madison, this court held that a president's official acts can never be examinable by the courts, a doctrine this court has reaffirmed over two centuries. So there is some language in Marbury. I think they tend to overextend its reach here, but there is some verbiage in Marbury that does speak to this proposition. Continuing the tradition, this court held in 1982 that courts cannot hold a former president personally liable for acts within the outer parameters of official responsibility, and in that case, speaking about civil liability. The court should restore the tradition from Marbury Fitzgerald unbroken until last year and neutralize one of the greatest threats to the president's separate power, a bedrock of a republic in our nation's history. The court should uphold the president's immunity from criminal prosecution for official acts. Pretty simple sort of introduction to the case, kind of sets out the grounds pretty well. On August the 1st of 2023, President Trump was indicted on four counts for alleged conduct occurring during his presidency. The indictment charges President Trump with five types of conduct, all constituting official acts of the presidency. So that's what they say, at least. Whether that's a fair characterization is a little bit neither here nor there at this point, because assuming that any of it relies on official acts, which it does at least in part, and also, also for Georgia as well in their RICO case, at least in part, some of the acts that are described in the indictments are at least related to his official acts, and maybe all those should be excluded. Maybe none of those are fair game. So that's sort of what they're talking about. First, it alleges that Trump, President Trump, using official channels of communication, made a series of tweets and other public statements on matters of paramount federal concern, contending the 2020 president federal election was tamed by fraud and irregularities that should be addressed by government officials. Second, the indictment alleges that the president communicated with the acting attorney general and officials at the U.S. Department of Justice, who it's worth noting, of course, do work for him, regarding investigating suspected election crimes and irregularities and whether appoint a new acting attorney general. It alleges that the president communicated with the vice president, the vice president's official staff, and members of Congress to urge them to exercise their official duties in the certification process in accordance with the position, based on voluminous information available to the president in his official capacity, that the election was tainted by excessive fraud and irregularities. 
Fifth, the indictment alleges that other individuals organized slates of alternative electors from seven states to help ensure the vice president would be authorized to exercise his official duties in a manner urged by President Trump. According to the indictment, these alternate slates of electors were designed to validate the vice president's authority to conduct his duties as the president urged. President Trump moved to indictment based on immunity, among other grounds, of course. The district court wrongfully held that the former president enjoys no immunity from criminal prosecution for his official acts. The D.C. Circuit affirms, likewise incorrectly holding that the former president has no immunity from criminal prosecution and this Supreme Court has granted certiorari because this is pretty much the definition of a question of exceptional importance. So as you're looking for reasons for the Supreme Court to take cert, this is certainly one of them, right? We, we take cert when there's a division of authority or you know there was some mess up by the lower court that requires our supervisory view, or as here, there's a case of paramount federal importance that requires the Supreme Court's review. This would pretty much qualify as that category. We're trying to figure out whether the pr Trump, whether the president, and again, this is not necessarily Trump, this is Biden as well. So the logic flows both ways, of course, worth pointing out. Right. If if Trump can be charged, Biden can be charged. If Trump can't be charged, Biden can't be charged. That's one of the things, incidentally, that makes this non-political, or at least should be, because the logic would necessarily have to apply. And if you don't think that you know some prosecutor somewhere can't figure out a reason to try to charge Biden, you're out of your mind. Because how many federal laws there are, how many laws there are that apply to the president or the person, no one can even bother to count. It's it's impossible. No one no one can count. So if Trump enjoys immunity, Biden enjoys immunity. If Biden doesn't enjoy immunity, Trump doesn't enjoy immunity. And around and around we go. So we're looking for a consistent answer here on what we can do or can't do within the bounds of what is the law. So that's the question. A former president enjoys absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for his official acts. Criminal immunity arises directly from the executive vesting clause and separation of powers. From Marbury through Fitzgerald and beyond, this court is consistently held. Article three courts cannot send judgment over the official acts, whether before or after he leaves office. I mean, not exactly, but there's certainly a lot of, let's say, dicta along those lines. A for Tory, the courts cannot sim sit in criminal judgment over him and imprison him based on official acts. The impeachment judgment clause reflects the founders' understanding that only a president convicted by the Senate after impeachment could be criminally prosecuted. The Constitution authorizes the criminal prosecution of a foreign president, but it builds in a formidable structure check against a politically motivated prosecution by requiring a majority of the House and a supermajority in the Senate to authorize the action. The founders thus created a balance for the public interest in assuring accountability for the president against the mortal danger to our system of government present, presented by a political target of the chief executive. The language in the Constitution is not exactly super duper clear on this idea, but we're trying to get a negative implication out of the language we do have, and we're showing a policy reason for why that language might be read that way, so fair enough. The long history of not prosecuting presidents for official acts, despite ample motive and opportunity to do so, demonstrates the newly alleged power to do so does not exist. Well, I'm not sure about that either. Just because something's never happened doesn't mean that it can't happen. So I'm not sure about that, but fine. This lack of historical precedent provides a telling indication of severe constitutional problems with the asserted power. Further telling is the fact that criminal immunity is more deeply rooted in common law than civil immunity. Okay, I'm not really sure I agree with that characterization either, but fine. Functional considerations rooted in the separation of powers within this court emphasized in Fitzgerald compel a finding of criminal immunity. The threat of future prosecution would distort the bold and unhesitating action required of the independent chief executive. Fair. The chief executive, who is charged with the most sensitive and far-reaching decisions entrusted to any individual under our constitutional system. As recent history of impeachment demonstrates, once our nation crosses this Rubicon, every future president will, de facto, will face de facto blackmail and extortion while in office and will be harassed by political and motivation prosecution after leaving office over his most sensitive and controversial decisions. Facts. Facts. That bleak scenario would result in a weak and hollow president 
and would thus be ruinous for the American political system as a whole. That vital consideration alone resolves the question of phase or dismissal. Well, I don't know about that. I wouldn't go that far, but it certainly does counsel caution as we try to look into the future because, you know, we're all forward-looking people because we're not morons. We realize that, of course, whatever rule applies to Trump will apply to Biden and his successor and their successors long after this case has, has been, you know, turned into dust, as it were. This will affect not just Trump and Biden, but the, the, the 20th president from now, the 30th president from now, and so forth and so on. People that haven't even been born yet will be impacted by this decision because that's how law works. So, yes, if we say that Trump has no immunity, then we can imagine in the, in the, in the system of government that we have with the 94 federal prosecutors we have, plus the 3,000 or so state-level prosecutors that we have, that you might be able to find some politically motivated people who might want to bring some charges against a president because, you know, it makes their resume look good. And, you know, so we have, uh, we have potential problems. So if we say that Trump is liable, criminally liable, how do we cabin that in a way to prevent it from all going to shit? That, that's, a, that's a really good question. How do we... How do we keep this in a box? There I am. The question of former president, criminal immunity president, presents a grave constitutional question. I agree, it's prudent for the Supreme Court to take this case. Accordingly, in addition to the clear provision of presidential immunity from criminal prosecution based on the exec executive vesting clause, I wouldn't call it a clear provision. It's a little overselling, but fine. The doctrine of immunity dictates that general criminal laws should not be construed to apply to the present or official acts. This court requires an express statement by Congress before assuming it intended the president's performance of official duties to be subject to judicial review, citing a prior case. By the same token, textual silence is not enough to subject the president to provisions of generally applicable criminal law, citing prior case law. This court is loath to conclude that Congress intended to press ahead into dangerous constitutional thickets in the absence of firm evidence it counter, counter those perils. Yeah, fair enough. So maybe this is just the president can't be held responsible unless like the law says that it applies to the president explicitly. Maybe that's what it needs to be. I don't know, but that's a, that's a really interesting way to do it. None of the criminal statutes charged in the indictment contain anything resembling a clear statement that applies to the president. Fair enough. I mean, these are generally applicable laws that he's being charged with. So, I, I mean, there's nothing that really in the statutes that are being brought up really contemplate the president at all. They're just general criminal statutes. So, fair enough. There's no indication that Congress intended to provoke the ultimate interbranch conflict by abrogating presidential immunity and authorizing the prosecution of the president through sweeping, vaguely phrased criminal law. Fair. Thank you, Anne Rasmussen, for the 10 gift memberships. We do appreciate everyone who helps us support the channel financially. Thank you for everyone who hits the beautiful, beautiful join button. This court should dismiss the indictment. If it somehow does not, in ascertaining to what extent criminal immunity applies to the former president, the court should be guided by four, four considerations. First, consistent with Fitzgerald, the scope of immunity should extend to the outer perimeter of the official acts. I mean, fair. That, that makes sense. So to, what, to whatever the immunity applies would apply to whatever is within his official acts. And we're willing to push that a little bit for a little bit because, you know, the president. It is worth, of course, noting that, of course, the president is the executive unto himself. Because the Constitution says that. It says it right in Article 2, Section 1. The executive branch shall, be the, the, shall exist in the form of the President of the United States. So the executive branch is the President. The President is the executive branch. So the, exec, the President, by virtue of being the entire executive branch unto himself, necessarily has every defense any member of the executive would have. Because he's all of them. That's what he is. He is all of them. He, he, is, he is all their powers combined, literally. As the president, we've we've divided it, you know, two million different ways for all the people who serve at, you know, serve within the executive branch. Well, that might be a bit of a statement, but still we've we've split it, you know, a couple hundred thousand ways for all the people who serve at the executive branch. But he naturally has 
all the defenses any of them would have because they're all but fractions of his power. He is the principal, they are but his agents, and so forth and so on. The protection should be absolute, not qualified. Establishing criminal immunity is as coextensive with the civil immunity follows a compelling logic. Well, I don't know if that's quite correct because civil law and criminal law, while closely related, of course, do enjoy some deviations. And so I'm not sure that you can necessarily read the one onto the other like this, but you know, why not try? If reflects the court's preference for bright line rules, rather than case by case adjudication for question involving separation of powers. Yes, the Supreme Court and me do prefer bright line rules when possible because they're clean and clean is nice. Moreover, protects Article Three courts from being drawn into the vortex of a political dispute every time immunity questions are raised. That's another problem to it, right? So if we leave this, if we leave this open to some sort of balancing analysis or some sort of threshold consideration, right? Then it leaves open the possibility that judges, who of course are only human themselves, will then have to be brought into the political thicket, which is not ideal. Because we, we really like to prefer very much the judges stay out of the politics. That's not what they're supposed to do. So a, a clean rule, a clean rule saves the judiciary as well because it's just something clean. And then, then everyone's happy, or at least everyone's equally clear, which is just as good. Second, if the court determines that immunity exists but requires a fact-based application, the court should follow standard practice and remand to the lower court to apply the doctrine in the first instance including conducting any fact-finding necessary to determination prior to any fi findings in this case. So, yeah, maybe, although it would be probably helpful if you returned it with some sort of instructions about what the lower court's supposed to look for. If you just return to lower court and be like, you figure it out, that's just asking for a lot of pain at this point. Third, if the court adopts a form of qualified immunity, which should not do, the court should emphasize the two fundamental features of the doctrine. First, the breadth of the qualified immunity protection corresponds to the breadth of the duties, which is the presence are extraordinary and almost completely broad. They necessarily assume the entire executive branch. Second, qualified immunity requires a high degree of specificity in defining outlawed conduct that applies with obvious clarity of the situation, rendering the unlawfulness of the challenge beyond debate. These principles should continue to guide any application of qualified or modified immunity on a man. Well, fair, although I feel like that just kicks the can down the road in the present situation, but it's an interesting idea. Fourth, the court should reject the DC's alternative approach, DC Circuit's alternative approach of denying a present criminal immunity when his conduct is allegedly motivated by the desire to remain in power unlawfully. This approach contradicts Marbury's holding that presence official acts can never be examined by the courts. Again, they're overreading that line, but it does say that for as much value as it has. It cannot be squared with the court's holding reaffirmed in a long line of cases that official immunity does not turn on alleged purpose or motive of the supposed misconduct. That's a lot closer. That's a lot closer in a way and, and also how we tend to treat police officers for what it's worth. We tend, we tend not to look to their subjective state. We tend to look to the, to the objective. You know, objectively, what is the situation? Not their, not their motives. So yes, that makes sense. That's sort of how we deal with the police and that's might be how we deal with the president as well. I mean, both police and the president are both executive branch. So that makes sense, sort of. Indeed, because virtually all first term presence official actions come, carry some at least partial motivation to be reelected, fair. This exception to immunity would swiftly engulf the rule. Further, such a case-by-case -case approximation would continuously throw the course into a vortex, which the Supreme Court definitely does not want. The Supreme Court, among other things, definitely does not want to have to like pick sides on a case-by-case -case basis. That does not sound like something the, case, the, court, the Supreme Court wants to do. They really do not want to have to decide this case 30 more times. They would really prefer to decide it once. 
Worst of all, the approach risks creating the appearance of a gerrymandered rule tailored only to deprive President Trump of immunity while leaving all our presence untouched, which is also a problem, right? So if we if we try to like if we try to cabin this thing too tight, then we wind up in the problem of we've created a rule just for President Trump, which is also not great, right? So it's like, okay, when I talk about cabin, I mean restricting or limiting or curtailing. I use the term cabin a lot. It's like keeping, keeping it in the box, keeping it in the box. All right. So UK, you want to, you want to say, what is the, what is the, you want to prosecute Trump? And I'm like, how about just no? How about just no is the clearest answer, right? That is the thing that, that makes the box the smallest because it contains nothing. Right, so keeping everything in the box is really easy because, well, everything's in the box or nothing's in the box, depending on your point of view. But still, it's the same thing, right? Everything's in the box because, well, the answer is just no, you know, no, no must, no fuss. All right. So you want to open this thing up and all right. And I'm like, OK, you're you're opening up the per, you're opening up Pandora's box. What do you propose to do to prevent this from going completely to shit? How do you open this in a way? That doesn't just apply, that, that doesn't just result in every president for the rest of time being indicted and, and, and tried for whatever anyone can dream up. How do you not re just result in that horrible? Now, maybe, you're like, maybe your answer to that solution is, maybe your answer to that is, well, I don't mind very much. That sounds okay to me. But uh, that doesn't sound okay to me, to be honest. I don't, I don't like that solution. So it's like, like I, need something, I, need, I need something that doesn't open the box completely. Right, keeping the box co closed completely has a certain appeal to it. Opening the com opening the box completely looks like a horror show. So it's like, okay, can you open the box only a little bit? And we give some answers along here that sort of try to tease that out a little bit, but then we come up with this wonderful line. It's like you do run into the problem of maybe just like opening the box just for Trump, just this one time, just the tip. And it's like, first of all, you probably can't do that. And second of all, even if you could do that, it's like, well, that's not fair. That's not really fair to just open it just for Trump, just this one time. It's really super important. We'll never do it again. Like, even if you could somehow, or, or, even if you could somehow prevent this from ever being applied ever again, how does that comply with fundamental notions of fairness, like equal protection? It doesn't really work. So you need to figure out a way to open the box to get President Trump inside it and also like not make it envelop the world. And that's the tricky part. In view of the special nature of the president's constitutional office and functions, the president has absolute immunity from civil damages within actions of his outer perimeter of office. This conclusion rests on the presence on the constitutional, the structure and structure. Is it impossible? No, it's not necessarily impossible. It's just really hard. That's why we're talking about it. It's really hard. These authorities all point to the same decision direction. A former president has absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for acts within the outer perimeter of his official responsibility. Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution vests the executive power shall be vested in, in a president of the United States. Seems pretty clear. The president is the executive unto himself. Under that clause in separation of powers, that commands Article 3 courts lack authority to send judgment directly over the president's official acts. The clause has been consistently misunderstood that way from Marbury to Fitzgerald in the present day. In Marbury versus Madison, the Attorney General, Charles Lee, declared it to be his opinion, grounded in a comprehensive view of the subject, that the president is not amenable to any court for the, judici for the judic judication for the exercise of his high functions, but is responsible only in the mode pointed out by the Constitution, that is, the impeachment process. Justice Marshall agreed by the Constitution of the United States, the president is invested with certain political powers in the exercise of which he is to use his own discretion and is accountable only to his country in his political character and to his own conscience. 
Whatever opinion may be entertained of the manner in which the executive discretion may be used, there still exists and can exist no power to control that discretion. Being entrusted to the executive, the decision to the executive is conclusive. I mean, maybe that, maybe that is the right answer. So maybe it's just close the box. Maybe that's the right answer. In cases in which the executive possesses a constitutional or legal discretion, nothing can be more perfectly clear than that. The president's acts are only politically examinable. According to the president's acts can never be examinable by the courts. An unbroken line of authority reaffirms this view from Arbery to the present. In Martin versus Mott, the court declined to exercise jurisdiction over President Madison's official acts during the War of 1812. Martin rejected the notion that the legality of the president's official acts might be passed upon by a jury, such that the legality of the orders of the president would depend not only on his own judgment of the facts, but upon a finding of facts upon proof submitted to a jury. It is no answer that such a power may be abused, for there is no power which is not susceptible of abuse. That's, that's fair. The remedy for this, as well as all other official misconduct, if it should occur, is to be found in the Constitution itself, that is, through impeachment. Citing Marbury, Justice Story, Martin's author, wrote in 1833 that in the exercise of political powers, the president is to use his own discretion and is accountable only to his country and his conscience. His decision in relation to the powers is subject to no control, and his direction when exercised is conclusive. This court reaffirmed the doctrine soon thereafter. The executive power is vested in a president. As far as his powers are derived from the Constitution, he is beyond the reach of any other department, except in the mode prescribed through the Constitution through the impeaching power. So you're seeing like a lot of this language pop up over and over again. Of course, they were never confronted with the question, like we're being confronted with the question now. But you do have a lot of the law of the Supreme Court saying, you know, yeah. In Mississippi versus Johnson, again, signed to Marbury, this court held it lacked jurisdiction to enter an injunction against President Johnson to prevent him from enforcing the Reconstruction Acts. The president is in the executive department, which cannot be restrained in action by a judicial department. An attempt on the part of the judicial department of the government to enforce the performance of such duties by the president may be justly characterized in the language of Chief Justice Marshall, Marshall, Marshall as an absurd and excessive extravagance. Marbury is a great read. Marbury is a great read, and I think it's a great decision. I agree. This immunity is necessary to avoid the collision with other branches. This court has no jurisdiction of a bill to enjoin the president in the performance of his official duties. In 1948, this court held that the official acts embody present discretion as to political matters and are beyond the competence of the courts to adjudicate. Such matters involve the exercise of unreviewable present discretion and lie within the presidential executive ultimate control. Whatever such order emanates from the president is not susceptible of review by the judicial department. Okay. According, no court has authority to direct the president to take an official act. Article 3 may not require the president to exercise the executive power in judicially prescribed fashion. No court has ever issued an injunction against the president himself or held it in contempt of court. It is incompatible with the president's constitutional position. They be compelled personally to find his executive actions before the court. Thus, an apparent unbroken historical tradition implied in the separation of powers dictates a president may not be ordered by the judiciary to perform particular executive acts. With regard to the president, courts do not have jurisdiction to enjoin him and have never submitted the president to declaratory relief. The federal courts have never sustained an injunction against the president in connection of an official duty. Importantly, this is also DOJ's consistent litigation position, as I'm sure they have said many times throughout the years. In Nixon versus Fitzgerald, this court held the president enjoys absolute immunity from civil liability for his official acts, that is, acts within the outer perimeter of his official responsibility. 
Fitzgerald thus provides a bookend to Marshall's ruling in Marbury. Fitzgerald held that the president's civil immunity is a functional, functionally mandated incident of the president's unique office, rooted in the constitutional tradition of separation of powers and support by our history. Fitzgerald's lies squarely in the tradition of Marbury. The president's official acts can never be examined by the courts. And thus, courts cannot impose civil liability on him for, for him personally. For over two centuries, the Article Three courts have effectively recognized they cannot examine, order, declare, enjoin, assess civil liability for or otherwise sit in judgment directly over the president's official acts. A fortori, and they seem to really like that wording for some reason. Article Three courts cannot sit in criminal judgment over the official acts. Because the court cannot examine the president's official acts, they cannot entertain charges, impose judgment, and imprison him on the basis of those acts. They cannot conduct a jury based on his official acts. When the president exercises an authority confided to him by law, including a former president, his official conduct cannot be passed upon by a jury or other proofs submitted by a jury. I mean, that's true. I mean, the decisions you made were made while you're president. So... I certainly don't think it's the case that you lose any immunity that you had when you stop becoming the president. Now, of course, you lose immunity going forward, but for things that happened in the past, they happened in the past when you have the immunity. So, The specter of a criminal prosecution of a former president for his official acts without first being impeached by the House of Representatives and convicted by the Senate by a high hurdle of two-thirds majority as the Constitution requires, creates maximal intrusion on the independence of the executive branch, far greater than any th threat posed by mere injunctive or declaratory relief. The president's personal vulnerability to stigma and criminal pros pros punishment will inevitably cause the distortion of the executive decision-making process with respect to official acts that would stem from worry as the possibility of such liability. A president isn't like a regular citizen. It's a positional authority kind of thing. Um, I don't think that's quite the right way to think about it, to say the president isn't like another citizen. The president is the president is exercising the powers of the office of the president. It's a positional authority kind of thing. It's, uh, yeah, it's just, it's the, the, the power comes from the, comes from the, the office. Uh, so he's still a citizen. Um, a citizen who's exercising positional authority by by the station to which he's been elected. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a slightly better way of thinking about it, but yeah. <laughs> Criminal prosecutions, therefore, differ critically from law from two exercises of jurisdiction over the present. The court has long allowed that our renew, review of subordinates, official actions, and amenability to criminal subpoena. Like, unlike other forms of judicial process, prosecution involves personal vulnerability of the most threatening kind. In addition, there is no history or tradition of prosecuting presidents for the official acts. Okay, so that's all in sort of like, so that's all within the idea of like, just implicit separation of power stuff, right? Yeah, so that's all just that's all sort of that's all sort of rooted in the president being the executive branch and the executive branch being distinct from the other branches of government. So that's a pretty interesting line of theory, sign of, line of argument. All right, let's take a break while I answer some questions that you might have so far. They have some pretty good authority for those propositions. I will I will note I will note that the authority they cite can all reasonably be described as dicta. Now there's a lot of it though. So it's not just one passing phrase. It's been said a lot of times in a lot of different cases, but they were never critical to the question decided. That's what dicta means, right? It's a, it's it's something the courts say but isn't binding because it isn't necessary to decide the case. So but it is a lot of it and it's over a long period of time. And so you know, and they do have they do have good arguments for the idea. No president should ever have full immunity, not ever. Well, 
okay, but then you're back into the problem of having to define it in a way that makes sense. So that's, yeah, so that's, you can say that, but then what's the next step, right? So that's the challenge. If you say that no present should enjoy absolute immunity ever, then like, okay, so the present should sometimes not enjoy immunity. Okay, so what, on what basis, on what, ba on what basis do you, do they, do you say that they don't enjoy immunity? How do you make that decision? And what are the confines of that thing? So, you know, what are the next 10 words of your answer? Give me 10 words after that and we'll talk, you know? If this passes, which is the wrong phraseology, because we're not talking about a bill, we're talking about a Supreme Court decision. But if they, if, if Trump wins, I suppose, how will it affect with all the problems President Biden put the U.S. in? Well, what is, what is good for one is good for the other. If Trump enjoys immunity, Biden enjoys immunity for his official acts. And pretty much everything that Biden has done to make this country worse is an official act. So Trump, so Biden would be immune. If Trump is immune, Biden is immune. If Biden's not immune, Trump's immune. It's like, it's like you got, it's like, it's a consistent thing. It's one of the things that make it, makes it not political, right? Because like, well, what rule do I want to have in a way that makes sense consistently? What's to stop a state from making a silly law to target the president? That's a pretty good question. You know, that's a very good question. Or not even that. It's like, as long as you can find a jurisdictional nexus. You know? So, yeah. Yeah, you can't have your candy and eat it too. So how do you... How do you do that, right? So I'm not necessarily opposed to the idea that the president doesn't enjoy absolute immunity. I'm not, I'm not opposed to the idea. It's just like, okay, what's the next, what's the next step? You know, what is what is what is the what is the coherent principle? Right? You're just like the president should never have absolute immunity. Okay. So what should he have? What is the principle? And how do we apply that in a consistent way? That doesn't make everything go to hell. Yeah. So Congress would need to define all official acts. I'm not even sure that's possible for Congress to define all official acts, incidentally. Um, because the president enjoys power regardless of the Congress. That was Youngstown Steel, right? The, 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 the Congress of the United States could attempt to take all power from the executive away if they wanted to, right? They could pass a bunch of laws that tried to strip the president of all power but they wouldn't be able to do it. They'd be able to do a lot of it, but they wouldn't be able to do all of it, right? So even if, even if somehow Congress got a bill passed into law that stripped the president of all power, he would still have power because he has power built into the fact that he's president. Now he's exercising power at this point against the express will of Congress, but well, that's what Youngtown Steel talks about, so yeah. All right, so let's see if the impeachment clause does anything to keep Trump immune. This is argu this argument I am less impressed, impressed with, but we'll try. The text of an impeachment, if you wanna know what an official act is, John Doe, I, I saw that you're not serious, but if you wanna know if it's an official act, one of the easier ways to do that is to ask, could he do it if he wasn't president? That's one of the easier ways to figure out if it's an official act or not. Because if he can't do it, if he's not president, it's not an official, if he can do it, if he's not president, it's probably not an official act. You know, so yeah. If he can only do it because he's president, it's probably an official act. So that's the easy way to answer the question. Can he do it, can he do it if he's just Joe Biden or just Donald Trump? Or does he need to be present to do it? Yeah. 
That's a pretty good test. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good test. That's a pretty good way to. to pray. And it's also why, for example, it's also why running for office isn't an official act, because he doesn't need to be president to run for office. And the reason you know that is because he ran for office when he wasn't president. Now, didn't he? So I can't depend on him being in office, because that doesn't make any sense. So running for office isn't an official act, because it doesn't depend on him being in office. Yeah, so, yeah, that's, and so, for example, and making a campaign speech, holding a campaign rally, running, uh, making a campaign commercial, and so forth and so on. It's like, a lot of people do those that, a lot of people do those things that aren't the present, so it can't be an official act. Yeah. Was the Jan 6 speech an official act? Debatable. Debatable. Yeah, debatable. It's where things get more interesting. Like, because, yeah, it's, 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 yeah, can you do it if he's not present is a good starting point, not necessarily the end point of it. So, yeah, could anyone have given that speech on the ellipse? Well, maybe not strictly speaking on the ellipse, but you know what I mean. Could anyone have given that speech in Washington, D.C.? I mean, yeah, presumably, because nothing emerged from him being present. Does that mean it wasn't his official acts? Eh. So you do have to you do have to watch it a little bit there, you know. So yeah, he wasn't charged for giving the speech. That's fair, but someone asked. Talking behind a podium with a presidential logo, I don't think that's I don't think that's what does the thing. You know, strictly speaking, yes, he only he can speak behind the logo, but I don't think somehow because the logo's there magically makes it a presidential act. That seems a bit of an absurd conclusion. You know, the presidential seal is what determines whether it's presidential or not. That seems very unlikely. <laughs> What do I think about how Trump said it would be a bloodbath? You mean how he said how it would be economically a bloodbath? How, how the, there would be a bloodbath in the economy, like people say all the time? Yeah, it didn't bother me. Okay. The text of the impeachment judgment clause confirms the original meaning of the executive vesting clause. That is, that current and former presidents are immune from criminal prosecution for official acts. The impeachment judgment clause provides that after impeachment and Senate trial, the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. By specifying only that the party convicted may be subject to criminal prosecution, the clause dictates the president cannot be prosecuted unless he's first impeached and convicted. I don't like this argument very much, but you know, fine. Official acts are what the president states that are. That is for fuck sure is not true, Michael. That is for fuck sure not true presidential acts or what the presidents say they are that's fucking bullshit and you know better don't say don't say stupid ass shit thus the constitution provides for impeachment and conviction by political branches vitally requiring a two-thirds majority in the senate and therefore requiring a national political consensus as a principal structural test against political presidential malfeasance to a limited extent the constitution contains a partial intermixture of those departments for special purposes. One of the special purposes is the system of checks and balances, and impeachment is one of those checks. The clause's plain language presupposes an unimpeached and unconvicted president is immune from prosecution. By specifying the consequences of only one of two possible outcomes of impeachment, the party convicted, the clause entails that those consequences do not apply to the other outcome. I, I, uh... I don't, I don't buy that. The clause's plain implications that criminal prosecution, like removal from the presidency, and disqualification from other offices is a consequence of the coming about only after the Senate's judgment, not during or prior to the Senate trial. 
This is how Alexander Hamilton explained the impeachment provisions in the Federalist Papers. Hamilton described criminal prosecutions of present as a consequence of impeachment and wrote three times that prosecution of the present can only come after and subsequent to the Senate's conviction. The punishment which may be the consequence of conviction upon impeachment is not to terminate the chastisement of the offender. After having been sentenced to perpetual ostracism from the esteem and confidence and honors and emoluments of his country, he will still be liable to prosecution and punishment in the ordinary course of law. I don't know any better why do you think I'm here? To be a troll, possibly? I don't know. It's been known to happen. And if you don't know any better, then why are you stating it with such definitive certainty? Certainty. Why are you stating it as, why are you stating it as a fact if you don't know any better? So if you, by your own admission, don't know any better, then why are you stating something as a fact like you know something? Because you wrote it as a fact, even though you yourself say you don't know anything. So what's up with that? You tell me. <laughs> the president is at all times liable to impeachment, trial, dismissal from office, incapacity to serve, and any other, and forfeiture of his life and estate by subsequent prosecution in the ordinary course of law. The decisive weight of evidence from the founding generation confirms Hamilton's understanding. As noted above, the Chief Justice Marshall, Attorney General Lee, and Justice Story, <coughs> excuse me, All shared Hamilton's view that impeachment, not prosecution Article Three courts, provide the constitutional check against presidential malfeasance. James Wilson likewise asserted the president is amenable to the laws in his private character as a citizen and his public character by impeachment. All right. Likewise, this court has consistently held that the impeachment and removal process, not litigation Article Three courts, provides the constitutionally sanctioned check against presidential misconduct. Okay, and then they cite some other case law for that proposition. I thought it was a fact, but you already said that you didn't know what you're talking about, so this doesn't make any sense. I don't understand. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense to me. You thought it was a fact, but you also think that you don't know what you're talking about. So why? I don't, I don't get it. The writings in the Federalist Papers are not authoritative. That's true. They are not authoritative. But they are, you know... Well, very well respected authority but they're not authoritative yeah that's right he says the fact because he thought it was then he'd shoot him out but he himself admitted that he didn't know what he was doing see that's the thing he himself admitted to his own ignorance so it doesn't make any sense he stated as a he stated as a fact and then he said, well, I don't know what's going on. That's why I'm here. So why did he state it as a fact if he doesn't know? You see the inherent logical contradiction in that? Is it just me? No? Okay. Uh, tu, 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 tu. All right. The government itself, through the Department of Justice, acknowledges that where the president is concerned, only the House of Representatives has the authorities to bring charges of criminal misconduct through the constitutionally sanctioned process of impeachment. The constitutionally prescribed process of impeachment and removal lies in the hands of the duly elected and politically accountable individuals. The House and Senate are appropriate institutional actors to consider the competing interests favoring and opposing a decision to subject the president and the nation to Senate trial and perhaps removal. Congress is structurally designed to consider and reflect the interests of the entire nation 
and individual members of Congress must ultimately account for their decisions to the constituents. By contrast, the most important decisions in the process of the criminal prosecution would lie in the hands of unaccountable grand and pettit jurors, deliberating in secret, perhaps influenced by regional or other concerns not shared by the general polity, guided by prosecutors only indirectly accountable to the people. Preach, that's pretty much the Parade of Horribles uh, wrapped right up. The D.C. Circuit emphasized the historical practice of prosecuting subordinate officers before they're impeached and convicted. But as the D.C. Circuit also recognized, the Supreme Court has repeatedly emphasized the president is sui generis, which just means self-generating. The president occupies a unique position in the constitutional scheme. And the president's unique status under the Constitution distinguishes him from other executive officials. Thus, the court has long recognized the scope of the presidential immunity from judicial process differs significantly from the cabinet or inferior officers, which is true for sure. I mean, no one can doubt that much because all the cabinet officials are but fractions of his power. And they serve as a pleasure for that matter too. <laughs> DOJ further admits the impeachment judgment clause does not contemplate the practice of pre-impeachment pre prosecution of subordinate officials will extend to the president. Citing the 1973 analysis of Solicitor General Robert Bork. Oh, poor Robert Bork. Writes that the timing of the impeachment relative to the indictment, the convention records show the framers contemplate the sequence should be mandatory only as to the president. In the 1973, Solicitor General Bork wrote that the convention di debates distinguished the president from subordinate officials for this very point. Certainly nothing in the debate suggests that the immunity contemplated for the president would extend to any other letters or officer, which is fair enough, because again, they aren't him. He is all their powers combined. They might have some of it, but definitely not all of it. That wouldn't make any sense. Yeah, it's a name you hadn't heard in a while. Yeah, Bork's name hasn't been... Yeah, it's been a while since I've mentioned Bork's name out loud, too. And it's been a while since I mentioned Bork's name out loud, too. So, you know, it's a little bit of a flashback to history. Those who know, know. And those who don't know are either too young or don't know history. I don't know. Well, the two. For those of you who don't know, Bork was, Bork was nominated to the Supreme Court and went through an extremely contentious hearing that ultimately wound up him not seeking the bench. And in case you're wondering what the contention looked like, he was labeled as alt-right, far-right, neo-Nazi, KKK-loving, segregationist, blah, blah, blah. This, this, does any of this sound familiar? You know, the worst, the worst nomination that's ever been had in the history of the court will deliver us all to the plains of evil, blah, 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 blah. And Robert Bork, um, you know, uh, you know, yeah, it was very uh, unceremoniously denied the job. And as a result, uh, a result of those hearings, in large part, you now know, now no longer Supreme Court uh, nominees say anything. They don't say anything in Congress because they learn from watching Bork. So yeah, so he got Borked hard. According to the DOJ, then the founders understood an impeachment clause entails. Subordinate officials could be subject to prosecution without first being impeached and convicted. But the president could not be, which is exactly what centuries of subsequent historical practice reflect. The impeachment judgment clause, therefore, directly stresses the D.C. Circuit's emphasis on the fundamental interest in the enforcement of the criminal law. The founders weighed that the fundamental interest against the countervailing interest far more pressing in their eyes and avoiding the cycles of recrimination that have been great engines in which the violent factions have usually wrecked or honored each other. The founders thus adopted Kyle's comfortably bound scheme. All right, so that's interesting on the, um, that is interesting on the, um, the impeachment clause thing. I'm not sure that really does anything for me because it's written in the negative, right? It doesn't tell you, or it's written only one way. It's like, if he's convicted, yes, you can still try him. 
but that doesn't tell you like anything about not A, right? A therefore B doesn't really tell you what if not B, not what doesn't tell you really if not A in basic logical reasoning, right? A therefore B, not A, therefore question mark. You don't know. So yeah, it's, it's not exactly ideal. All right, so then they're going to go through some political history, which we've kind of already discussed a little bit. So we kind of kind of skip that. Common law immunity doctrines. We can federal common law, I suppose. Interesting. So they're arguing for a federal common law, which is pretty interesting. Functional considerations rooted in separation powers. We kind of got that already. What else have we got that we haven't talked about already? Mm. Blah, blah, blah. All right, so we got some arguments to the contrary we can discuss for a while. All right, so let's see what they got on arguments to the contrary. We'll discuss that a little for a little while. Oh, Lord. Sinuses, man. All right, so let's discuss arguments to the contrary. Attempts to distinguish Marbury. The special counsel and lower courts attempt to distinguish Marbury as progeny are meritless. First, the special counsel admits a president's official acts are not subject to the injunctive power, but he argues that under Marbury, this immunity vanishes once the president leaves office. This argument contradicts Marbury, which states that president's official acts can never be examined by the courts. Questions which are by the Constitution law submitted to the executive can never be made in court. The argument also contradicts Justice Story, who wrote that in his official acts, the president is accountable only to his country and his conscience, as discretion is conclusive. It contradicts Matt versus Martin versus Mott, which held long after President Madison left office, the legality of his orders could not be passed upon by a jury or decided upon proof submitted to a jury. Likewise, as it regards with Fitzgerald, which held that former President Nixon pr pr protected by absolute immunity years after he left office. Second, the D.C. Attempt, circuit's attempt to distinguish Marbury by holding the President has a ministerial duty to comply with general applicable law. The special counsel does not defend this distinction, which contradicts DOJ previous litigation position and distinctions meritless. Due to comply with the generally applicable criminal law, cannot plausibly be described as ministerial. Rather, it is quite essentially discretionary. A ministerial duty is a precise court articulatedly mar marked out by law, which is to be strictly pursued. It is a simple defined duty, which nothing is left to discretion. Criminal laws prohibit broad and many times ill-identified Ill forms of conduct, while leaving their subjects with a wide range of discretion in how to behave without violating the prohibition. Thus, the obligation to comply with the criminal laws necessarily involves balanced use of discretion. In fact, no court has held that the president has any ministerial duties, and the president's unique role as chief executive is based on discretion mandated by the separation of powers. Third, both the special counsel and the D.C. Circuit point out that Article III courts do, in some circumstances, review the legality of the president's official acts as carried out by the executive branch. But as the D.C. Circuit admits, all those cases exercise jurisdiction only over the subordinate officers, not the president himself. The writ in Marbury was brought against the secretary of state against a commander of the ship of war, and Kendall against a postmaster general in Youngstown against the Secretary of Commerce. Now, fair enough. So read on that for a while. The special counsel relies heavily on the presumptive of regularity in the governmental actions. That presumption of regularity has no application here and is fully contradicted by, by the precedent of not persecuting the presence for the first 234 years of our nation. The founders recognized the prosecution of the president is inherently political and must be assigned to political branches under the impeachment judgment clause, and that wisdom endured until last year. 
The founders were keenly aware that political motivated prosecutions pose a grave threat to the Republican form of government. James Madison warned that newfangled and artificial treasons had been the great engines by which violent factions, the natural offspring of free government, has usually weakened, wrecked the alternate malignity on each other. Good stuff. Both the special counsel and the D.C. Circuit contend that criminal immunity would place the president above the law. As Fitzgerald held, this contention is reportedly chilling, but wholly unjustified. The remedy of impeachment demonstrates the president remains accountable under law for misdeeds in office. It's simply an error to characterize an office as above the law because a particular remedy is not available against him. This is even more true here because the impeachment judgment clause expressly authorizes criminal prosecution of the president provided he's first impeached by the House and convicted by the Senate. Indeed, a rule with absolute immunity for the president will not leave the nation without sufficient protection against misconduct on the part of the chief executive. There remains a constitutional remedy of impeachment. In addition, there are formal and informal checks over presidential action, including constant scrutiny by the press and vigilant oversight by Congress, which makes critical threats of impeachment among others. The existence of alternative remedies and deterrence establishes absolute immunity will not place the president above the law. Mm -hmm. The special counsel objects to these authorities by arguing that if impeachment and conviction are prerequisites, some presidents who engage in wrongdoing might escape criminal punishment, such as those who conceal their official crimes until after they leave office, and those who, for political consensus, need for Senate conviction does not materialize. Nevertheless, as to grave offenses, DOJ itself notes that the president who commits a grievous wrongdoing, that is, that would create the political consensus for the punishment the Constitution demands, would face speedy and punishment and conviction in the Senate. Yeah, but even if some level of president malfeasance, not presently in the case at all, were to escape the, cons the punishment, that is the risk inherent in the design. The founders viewed that protecting the independence of the presidency as well worth the risk that some presidents might evade punishment in marginal cases. They are unwilling to burn the presidency itself to the ground to get every single alleged malfactor. Indeed, every structural text in the Constitution carries a singular risk of under enforcement. And then they go through the generally applicable law and how it doesn't apply to the president. We can skip that for the moment. And then they talk about qualified immunity, and so they talk about some alternate, alternate immunities, which we already discussed sort of in the header. So they get through the alternates, which we talked about in the header. Okay. Though it rejected criminal immunity as a categorical matter, the D.C. Circuit advanced an alternate meritless holding to deny immunity in this case in particular. The D.C. Circuit suggests that the president is not immune from prosecution if the alleged misconduct was motivated by an attempt to stay in office unlawfully beyond his term. The court should reject this gerrymandered approach to the immunity for several reasons. First, the approach contradicts the plain holding of Marbury and its progeny. Marbury held that presidential official acts can never be examinable by the courts. Rather, the president is... The president's discretion when exercised is conclusive. Second, the approach contradicts the court's consistent holding that immunity decisions do not turn on defendants' alleged purpose or motive. Yeah, that makes sense. We discussed that a little bit. They discussed the vortex of the political thicket. Real world examples illustrate the difficulty and intrusiveness of questions. Were President Clinton's military strikes in the Middle East motivated by motivated to distract the voting public's attention from the Monica Lewinsky scandal? Were President, Trump's re President Bush's representations of Congress about weapons of mass destruction motivated by the purpose of looking tough on terror and thus getting reelected? Is President Biden destroying our southern border and undermining our national security abroad for unlawful election purposes? Such political inquiries into presidential motives would be highly intrusive and would strain the competence. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, and then they get to the conclusion and the end of this thing. All right, so, and then they go through the, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing, and that's all right. All right, so I do have one more treat for you before we sign off today. I do have one more treat for you guys who stayed in to the end. A non-serious brief. Someone actually filed. I'm not making this up. 
So, just to prove to you that, you know, not all briefs before the U.S. Supreme Court are necessarily created equal, and some people apparently have way too much time on their hands and don't mind being embarrassed by filing things, I bring to your attention the filing of the brief of Amica Curie, David Boyle, filed by David Boyle. Mr. Boyle is an attorney. Mr. Boyle has some thoughts. Mr. Boyle would like to express his thoughts with the U.S. Supreme Court himself personally. Okay, Mr. Boyle, let's see what you got for us today. I'm sure it's going to be super duper great. All right. All right. The present, amic the present amicai curie, David Boyle, wants the immunity case of petitioner Donald Trump to be treated fairly. Since Trump has as many rights, if not more, than any other American, Trump is a criminally indicted shoe salesman. And then we got a picture of Trump with his shoes. Now, guys, I have to be honest. I've not seen a lot of Supreme Court petitions with graphics in them. But apparently we're trying the picture book, picture book approach to Supreme Court amicus briefs for some reason. Uh, okay. Amicus wants all Americans to be treated justly, accounting for his interest in the case. This isn't to call Trump a good person. Indeed, that son of man has been compared to Charles Manson. And then he provides a, sh provides a mugshot of Donald Trump along with a mugshot of Charles Manson. This guy is apparently a licensed attorney before the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, we're doing picture time. Over okay, that's that's good times. Uh, all right. Um, if Trump is proud of his mugshot and even sells clothing bearing it, why not show his fellow arrestee slash woman abuser slash violence for men or mugshot here too? Sauce for the goose. That apparently was the introduction. Summary of the argument. There was... There was th Presidential, uh, uh, presidential official acts immunity should be reasonably limited and not immunize election fraud violence. Since Trump may pardon himself if reelected, the Trump's op upcoming opinion and Trump's trial shouldn't be unduly delayed. Giving Trump excessive immunity or slow walking the opinion trial may associate the court with a chaos and evil. And a current blockbuster film is resonant here. What? <laughs> what? What? Okay. Official acts immunity is acceptable within limits, but not for threatening to hang Mike Pence. But even Manson had due process rights, and Trump is partially right about immunity from prosecution for acts as president. The normal run of presidential decisions may allow for post-presidential immunity. Say, take, say, a president who must negotiate with a foreign country let American hostages go and the country later attacks other Americans. A vicious critic says the president should have just bombed the foreigners into oblivion instead of negotiating. So the president's a traitor and must be prosecuted. But the president's actions may exemplify a president acting within his or her broad discretion, thus not being prosecutable. However, as a reducto ad absurdum, if the president also gave the foreign land a trainload of nuclear weapons and said, hey, hey please blow up America with these, he might well be prosecuted, maybe even while still in office for acting ultra virulent and treasonably. Okay. On that note, whether the court's upcoming opinion can confirm that immunity exists for reasonably official acts, it could also confirm that for utterly non-reasonable official acts, for example, asking foreigners to murder innocent Americans, or acts taken as part of running for office, such as the January 6, 2021 related acts, for example, threatening to hang Mike Pence to get Trump reelected, not for performing the duties of the office, immunity will not exist. Uh huh. Trump may legally be able to pardon himself if reelected, thus, the court's opinion, and Trump's trial should not be unduly delayed. 
As for another type of immunity, folk have made weak arguments that the president cannot pardon himself. For example, that one cannot grant oneself something or be a judge in one's own case or committing self-dealing. But one can't grant oneself things. Forgiveness, for example, and pardoning someone isn't the same as being a judge in the case. Traditionally, monarchs have had the power of pardon. And people in the government can even increase their own sa salaries, despite Congress people having to wait years before it takes effect. Thus, arguments against self-pardon power are quite questionable. The therefore, it may be a fool's hope to think Trump cannot pardon himself for his crimes if, if re-elected. <laughs> Thus, it makes it imperative that while the court shouldn't rush Trump's trial, if one occurs, to the extent it denies him rights, it also shouldn't delay Trump's trial for one day beyond when it should occur. Even if, someone th even if some think Trump is citizen shame, January 6th Osama, pussy-grabbing Palpatine, or the white O.J. Simpson... Trump, like Charles Manson, still enjoys rights to a fair trial, but the public also has rights. That is one hell of a sentence in a Supreme Court petition. I just have to say, that is that is a sentence I did not anticipate reading in a Supreme Court brief, but apparently that's where we're at for some reason. Holy whatever is going on here. Amicus wants everyone's rights and duties respected and balanced, so files this brief for neither party. That also means that unless un absolutely necessary to delay the opinion, much less delay until the end of the term, the opinion should be released as soon as reasonably possible, say in early May. Voters have the right to know if Trump is a criminal before voting. Indeed, this case shouldn't be a Trojan horse letting Trump delay the trial until after the election. Justice delayed is justice denied, attributed to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Now, for chaos avoiding issues, dot, dot, dot. <sighs> avoiding the court of chaos, or Anderson, offers more reasons to avoid delaying the court's opinion or offering excessive immunity. Science fiction author Roger Zelaney wrote the novel The Courts of Chaos, 1978, including id, a character named Dworkin, though not legal theorist Ronald Dworkin, with a 1985 follow-up called Trumps of Doom, you could not make this up. Could, couldn't make what up? On that note, on that note and commenting on Trump v. Anderson, Amicus isn't fully endorsing the Anderson opinion. States have always caused chaos in elections. It's called the Electoral College, exclamation park. But it is what it is. Congress could now pass laws allowing prosecution of insurrectionist federal office candidates, maybe after the present election cycle, so seeming not to target Trump unfairly. Anyway, nothing in the Constitution requires that we endorse such chaos. If the court really wants to see some real chaos, though, it could either give Trump immunity for his alleged action, election fraud slash violence or overly delay its opinion or both. But the Constitution doesn't require those evils. January 6th may look like a picnic compared to what might happen if this court does either slash both of those things. Trump's of doom indeed. Riffing off Ronald Dworkin... One shall say, Ta taking both Trump and the public's rights seriously is important. As for the public's rights, the following cartoon illustrates the danger to the court's credibility if the court seeks to delay the unduly, seeks to delay unduly its opinion, and thus the Trump trial. And uh, here is a picture by apparently Shemmen from the Star Ledger with Trump. And what looks like Chief Justice Roberts. And they apparently say, we're scheduling arguments to decide if you're subject to the laws of man. What's a good time for you? Again, again, I, I've read a lot of Supreme Court briefs in my time. Can't remember a whole lot of them that had art in them. You know? Uh, there's yeah especially political cartoons um 
I don't think this is the way to Supreme Court, people. The, con the cartoon above is a sort of ghost of Christmas future, hat tip to Charles Dickens, a warning of what could happen if the court forgets the people have rights against Trump too. Indeed, the court shouldn't have to wait, want the public to see if the court of chaos and evil, as Roger Zelaney must say. Who is Roger Zelaney? I mean, I know he's the author of a book, but damn, why, why does this guy have such a hard on for Roger Zelaney? Uh, what did Roger Zelaney do to be mentioned in all this? The current film, Dune Part 2, hold me, features a would-be messiah, Paul Andrus, who, spoiler alert, finds he's the grandson of a bloated, sadistic tyrant, Baron Vladimir Hargnonen. Sounds like Vladimir Putin, question mark. Then prepares to outdo him, launching an insanely holy war which kills billions of people. Trump has a dark, pseudo-messiasic similarity. Indeed, Trump supporters have betrayed him as the gigantic, part warm, god of emperor of doom from Hank Herbert's eponymous 1981 work. Um... Okay, here apparently is a picture of Trump as the monster from the book Dune. When Trump portrays himself as messianic, godlike, and so do his followers, Dune Part 2, see above, Reminds us how chaotically evil and unhinged such messianic leaders tend to be. Trump, however, may legally be able to act unhinged as he wants, like Dune, God Emperor, and using his self-pardon power, that monarchical power, if he becomes president again. However, this court isn't obliged to make sure that E. Jean Carroll's rapist defamer is the president again. The court may be more effectively more obliged to see if he goes to trial quickly. Finally, Amicus thanks the court respectfully for having relatively expedited the present proceeding. Amicus regrets that President Joe Biden was disrespectful to the court in his recent State of the Union address, but Trump hasn't always respected the court either. <laughs> People should respect the court and vice versa. Conclusion. The court should neutrally, with patriotism and justice, Decide on fair parameters for presidents and ex-presidents, criminal immunity, and do so without undue fair, haste, or needless delay. Amicus humbly thanks the court for its time and consideration. Respectfully submitted, David Boyle. Well, that was a different Supreme Court brief. So, um... Yeah. <sighs> That was that was an interesting that was an interesting uh, way to finish up the stream there with a bit of levity. Who the fuck is David Boyle? I don't know. It's just a lawyer, as far as I know. It's just a guy who's a lawyer who has. You want to? Let's go to his firm webpage. We we got to find out more about this guy. Oh no, we got we got to find out more about this guy. Hold on, let's let's find out more about this guy. No, no, we got to find out more about this guy. Uh, all right, hold on. Um, well, I don't have permission to access his webpage. If you actually go to, uh, if you actually go to, If you actually go to boyleslaw.org, I don't have permission to access the resource. So sadly, we cannot learn more about David Boyle. Let's see if we can find another way of finding out about David Boyle. David Boyle, Long Beach, California. He has a LinkedIn page.
That can't be the guy. There's a David Boyle that's a special advisor to motion pictures. No, that guy looks respectable. That's not the right guy. Lawyers.com. Same if we can find out any information about Mr. Boyle. Civil rights lawyer serving Long Beach, California. Apparently, he's been licensed for 15 years. <laughs> what the hell is this? He's filed other things before the Supreme Court. Oh, he's insane. He's he's just insane. He's certifiable. Yeah, I, I took I took one look at a um I took one look at something else he filed. He's filed everything before the Supreme Court. He's he's insane. He's insane. I can't find any information on him other than some other amicus briefs he's filed. I found another brief you filed. Do you want to see a little bit more insanity from him? Do you want to see a little bit more of the David Boyle insanity? Have you guys been good? Would you like would you like to see some more David Boyle insanity? All right. We turn our attention to the case of students for fair admission versus Harvard versus UNC. This case was already decided, of course, a couple of years ago. Um, so we're reaching, we're reading a brief of, from the past from Mr. Boyle, who would like to share some thoughts when it comes to, who would like to share some thoughts when it comes to the issue of whether or not we should have racial-based discrimination in college admissions. Uh, you can tell from the table of contents right away we're off to a good start. Uh, argument. Section 1. The court must do better than its Dobbs opinion or dissent, lest it lose public credibility. Section 2. Justice Kanjanji Brown Jackson was chosen by open racial gender selection, so the court's members may be obligated to oppose her seat on the court if they truly oppose race-based affirmative action. Section 3. Supporting Israel, a.k.a. affirmative action for Jews, makes it awkward to say affirmative action is equal, evil, and must be banished. Section 4. The court should not abolish affirmative action before alumni children, college admission privileges themselves, a form of affirmative action, have been abolished. Here are some subtopics I'd like to discuss as part of this brief. 
The court might consider sua sponte abolishing alumni child or similar admission advantages. Why didn't petitioners sue respondents over alumni children admission advantages? The court's members should be transparent about any admission privileges their families have received or will receive, including alumni child, donor, or other privileges. Just because some alumni children are also underrepresented minorities, that doesn't justify keeping alumni children privileges. Underrepresented minorities should be able to opt out of preferential treatment and admissions if they feel stigmatized by it. Giving admissions privileges to children of donors is reminiscent of prostitution slash bribery. Wow. Ah. Uh. Petitioner, petitioner simulated alternative ending pr privilege petitions has good points, but does not logically imply affirmative action must end, and also massively wrongly hurts underrepresented minority applicants. Affirmative action does not logically require bias against um, Asian Americans or other group. It does, but okay. Two Asian American students supporting affirmative action. Affirmative action should survive for at least the 25-year grace period granted by Gretner, Gretner and possibly longer. Gretner is not plessy, especially given Brown, Colin Powell's embrace of affirmative action, and Martin Luther King's advocating actual quotes for underrepresented minorities. Then he has a section called anti-conclusion, anti-conclusion, and then a section called conclusion. This, this guy's insane. This guy's insane. The present Amakai Curie, David Boyle, has submitted briefs in various affirmative action cases at the court, recommending a thoughtful and maybe, maybe even moderate approach. He submitted other briefs. Thus, amicus would not mind thoughtfulness or due moderation by the court in the instant case, especially since the court itself has been peopled by affirmative action recipients. For example, Justice Amy Coney Barrett, chosen by President Donald Trump because she is a woman. Justice Kanzanji Brown Jackson, chosen by President Joe Biden because she's an African American woman. Amicus notes that presently, Petitioner wants to destroy affirmative action while not simultaneously suing for the destruction of, for example, alumni children and mission advantage, which are older than affirmative action and reward the already privileged. This disparity seems profoundly wrong. Because Israel arguably practices affirmative action for Jews, and most Americans support Israel, it's strange to argue affirmative action is inherently evil. What the fuck kind of a sentence is that? After reading, the, after reading the court's decision in Dobbs, which dealt with abortion, Amicus felt qu like quipping, enjoy it while it lasts. How that opinion is going to stand the test of history and future courts is questionable. Indeed, Dobbs sat a bad precedent. As the Chief Justice noted in his concurrence in judgment, the court's dramatic and consequential ruling is unnecessary to decide the case before us. And the court is sub skewed, biased towards one side, and Americans... Culture cough. This may not just taint the court, but in the instant affirmative action case. Ironically, if the court had approved Mississippi's banning abortion at 15 weeks but gone no further, any number of ambitious state attorneys general would have been slavered, would have slavered over their chance to have their own states and selves be showcased at the court and very soon regarding, regarding abortion, but properly. 
E.g. both their cert petitions and their merit briefs would have called for the overrule of Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood from the start instead of changing course from the extreme. Are we talking about affirmative action or are we talking about abortion now? I, how do we go from a term of talking about affirmative action to talking about abortion? We're, we seem to be critiquing, do, I don't know what we're doing now. We're talking about Dobbs. We're in the middle of a case that's, we're in the middle of a case dealing with students for fair admission and we spent four pages now talking about Dobbs. What the fuck is this? The Dobbs dissent has its own inaccuracies. That is, the dissenters complain about the opinion citing sources going back to the 13th century. The 13th! As if venerability of precedent is a problem. Worth an alarmed exclamation point? Id? Question mark? Even worse, the dissent did not notice is actually the 12th century. Even before Bracton's time, English law imposed punishment for the killing of a fetus. The opinion at 17 note 25 refers to Legas from the 1100s. Far worse than the sense time error though, the opinion omits mentioning, as has been pointed out to the court before, the penalty is merely, merely ecclesiastical. C. Spivak, Supra note at 130. Molier sis partum sum ante sil dies spondus peridentium tribus antus parentiat sis post quantum ansimus s quasi homicida via inus peritinum. A woman shall do penance for three years if she intentionally brings about the loss of her embryo before 40 days. If she does this after it's quick, she shall do penance for seven years if, if she were the murderess. A church penalty of penance for abortion is not a criminal or civil penalty, but the dissenters didn't call the majority's grossly misleading uh, omission about the penalty's ecclesiastical nature. An omission which calls in the legitimacy of the whole opinion in question. Why didn't the dissent notice this? Incomprehensible. One was almost tempted to quit. Does the court need new justices or just new clerks? Question mark. Yeah, quick would be alive in the parlance of the time. You're correct. The quick and the dead. You're absolutely correct. Quick means alive. The, 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 referring, referring to it as a quick fetus is not the confusing part. Uh, I, 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 I figured out exactly what that meant. Yes, quick just means alive. The quick and the dead. Quick just means alive. One of the slightly brighter spots in Dobbs, we're still talking about Dobbs for some way, by the way. Remember, remember, this is supposedly an amicus brief dealing about racial admissions in colleges. Theor theoretically, that's what this brief is about. But we're still talking about Dobbs. One of the, I, I got a whole new thing, man. I got a whole new thing. I mean, Nick Rakita's got nothing on me with Unbreaded. Nick, Nick Rakita's got nothing on me with Unbreaded. At all. Like, even a little bit. This guy is just apparently the gift that keeps on giving. The quickening movement of fetus. Exactly. That's what it means. You got it. You got it. That's what it means. Quick is living. You got it. You're, 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 you're there. You got it. 100, 100, 100. You got it. One of the slightly brighter spots in Dobbs is Justice Brett Kavanaugh's concurrence, which admits that the life of the mother might actually matter enough, exclamation mark, exclamation, exclamation mark, to prevent the state from forcing her to bear a trial if it kill her. The concurrence also admits that Berlin Wall laws, allowing states to penalize fugitive mothers from running to another state for abortion might be unconstitutional. So per Kavanaugh, 
Maybe the Constitution addresses abortion after all, which may fuel movement outside the court or inside the court to swing the pendulum back to the larger abortion rights. Constitution aside, though sheer public unhappiness with Dobbs has, well, if this is the post Roe generation, this is what it's really like. See, for example, Associated Press in Jerusalem, Israel eases abortion regulations in response to sad Roe versus Way ruling. The new rule is approved by an Israeli parliamentary committee, grant women access to abortion pills through the country's universal health system and remove a long-standing requirement that women appear physically before a special committee that before they're permitted to terminate pregnancy. I really don't like very much how I really don't like very much how much this guy is mentioning Jews. It's making me very uncomfortable. I'm not sure where he's going. But the amount of time he's mentioning Jews in his proceedings is not making me feel not making me feel super warm and happy fuzzy inside, I have to admit. I'm not sure how Israel I really I really, I'm really struggling to figure out how Israel uh, making it easier to get access to an abortion pill has anything to do with whether or not we should have racial admissions in the United States. But somehow David over here sees the connection some way. Are we still in the Jews? Oh, no, I'm sorry. We've moved to Sierra Leone now. We've moved to Sierra Leone for some reason. President Julius Mata Bio of Sierra Leone said in his cabinet would expand access to abortion at a time when sexual and reproductive health rights for women are being threatened with or threatened. We're proud that Sierra Leone can once again lead with regressive. How does Sierra Leone get into this? So Dobbs will now likely cause more abortions in mobile nations. One doesn't need to read Sof Sophocles to wonder if the Dobbs opinion's hubris is already bringing nemesis so that Dobbs may be a Pyrrhic victory for pro-life enthusiasts. There is even a recent opera booth of Justice Kavanaugh having to flee a steakhouse staked out by pro-choice protesters. Amicus is sorry this flight had to happen and is pleased that Kavanaugh has also escaped assassination. But if masses of Americans feel cheated of justice, unpleasant things may happen. Of that note, it's best after Dobbs, the court tried to avoid discussions that make Americans feel procedurally or substantively cheated, including in cultural war cases relating to sex, gender, religion, race, affirmative action, etc. <laughs> the duty to avoid cheating is especially pertinent in the instant case since the court itself flagrantly institutes affirmative action. Biden made his pledge days before the South Carolina primary. I'm looking forward to making sure there's a black woman on the Supreme Court to make sure we, in fact, get every rep representation. And Biden carried out his pledge, not allowing for whites, males, or anything but a black slash black woman. Joe Biden is a governmental official, president, who used and even proudly publicly proclaimed an exclusive racial gender test to nominate either Kentonji Brown Jackson or another African-American, again, exclusive. If race conscious affirmative action is really illegal, how is Jackson's selection for the court remotely legal or moral even? True, she's already on the court, and the court hasn't outlawed affirmative action yet, but the petitioner is suing to have Asian Americans transfer into colleges who allegedly discriminate against Asians. If that's not proper, then by extension, it would be obligatory for Jackson to leave the court, unless the court expands by one seat, maybe, dot, 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 and for the president to nominate a new candidate to transfer into the court without any racial or maybe gender criteria whatsoever. What the hell? We're going back to the Jews, baby. We're going back to the Jews. I'm not sure how the Jews are involved in this, but we're going back to the Jews over here. Okay, let's read some more. 
Speaking of hypocrisy, if a heckler sneeringly, if a heckler sneeringly asked an African American affirmative action supporter, "Are you for racial preference?" He she could answer, "Yeah, it's called Israel. God bless Israel without missing a beat." Anyone who professes to hate race conscious affirmative action but is happy with the existence of Israel as a purportedly Jewish state and American funding and arming for all that decades may be confused or dishonest. Various Jewish people organizations themselves have explicitly used the term affirmative action to describe what Israel does for Jews. See Tamar Sternal, from ethnic cleansing to casualty counts, reporting analysis. The rationale for affirmative action above is not exactly the diversity rationale in Gruder, but there's still the idea that racial preference might be needed in a pinch to do justice. See also Rabbi David Hoffman, Zionism is not a settler colonial undertaking. Holy shit. In essence, Zionism is not a settler, settler in essence, Zionism is not a settler colonial undertaking, but a national program of affirmative action. When one takes what is essentially affirmative action and understands it to be colonial oppression, then one is not far from gross, insensitiv gross insensitivity, the kind of insensitivity that leads to yet another holocaust. This guy is wackadoo. <laughs> what, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> This guy's a cray cray. Yeah, if you can view this as comedic, it's almost it's almost tolerable. This guy's having to pay a lot of money to have these things submitted to the court. Well, if we ever get bored, if we ever get bored, we can always go find a brief written by Mr. Boyle because he apparently is a, uh, he's a treat. This is, yeah, this is a bit. I don't know if it's a bit. He is, he is insane. Yeah, it's too chaotic for a bit. He's insane. He's insane, but apparently still has his law license. <laughs> what? Yeah, this guy's insane. He's the mod of several subreddits. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I appreciate that for sure. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to sign off for now because uh, Mr. Boyle has broken my spirit. Uh, we'll be on. How much does it cost to submit a Supreme, uh, amicus brief? It's a lot, actually. Because it's it's a lot because... Let me just double check the rules, but I'm pretty sure the rules are the same for the amicus as it is for the parties. But let me double check the rules. Printing costs are the the, the, the printing costs are the real bitch.
page 52. Let's see what it says on page 52. Let's see. Okay, support motion extended from time. Is signatory, blah, blah, blah. Rule 24. Yeah, I'm not sure how many you have to file. It's really expensive for the parties. Yeah, I'm not sure how much it is for an amicus. The thing that makes it so expensive is that the, that the, the Supreme Court has very precise rules um, for... Uh, for the printing. I think I think you have to do 40 copies. I think it's the same I think it's the same for an amicus as it is for the parties. Yeah, I think it's the same for parties. So you're looking at you're looking at uh, like three thousand dollars. The file. Yeah, you're looking at like three thousand dollars. I think. Your printing is a bitch. The printing is a bitch because you need to print it on this. Unless you, unless you're under a special rule, you need to print the book. You need to print your brief on six and an eighth by nine and a quarter paper, which no one uses. Okay. And it has to be produced on 60 pound paper, which is very heavy paper. That's some very heavy paper. Um, And then it has to be bound um, Yeah, the document shall be bound firmly at least two places along the side of the margin. Saddle stitch or perfect binding preferred. Spiral, plastic, metal, or string bindings may not be used. So, yeah, if you want to use one of the services for it, and you have to produce 40 copies of it for 40 copies. So if you want to do one of the services, it's basically $800. It's $800 plus, it's $800 plus about $20 a page, give or take. So it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how he's paying for this. Now, fortunately for my client, that I'm working on their brief, they fall into the exception. So they don't have to pay that because they can use normal eight and a half by 11 paper and I can actually just use a stapler. My client falls into a, my client falls into a very narrow exception. So good news for my client, instead of it costing them because it would cost them $3,500 for the, for the merit brief. Plus I'd have to do the reply brief, which is another, you know, 
$2,500. So instead of it being $6,000, it's going to be, you know, how much does it cost to print it on nice eight and a half by 11 by paper and, you know, it be stapled? Not very much. So instead of $6,000, it's going to cost them like, you know, 50 bucks. So it looked nice. So good for them. You know, so. Yeah. So. Plus, they don't have to pay the filing fee of $350. <laughs> so that's nice. So they get the file for free. And they don't have to use this. They don't have to use the super duper fancy paper. So I just can use any eight and a half by eleven paper. Now I'm not gonna let. I'm not gonna let me. I'm not gonna submit this on just normal paper. I'll go get some like nice, you know, cotton paper or something. You know, get something nice. It doesn't look like total shit. Uh, but you know, still they won't have to pay more than you know just nice paper at a you know an office supply store versus you know, just cheap ass printer paper. But get some nice, you know cotton paper or linen cotton paper or something would be nice and call it a day. What's the exception in this particular case, my client is, has an exception because they are, um, well, I don't know that I want to say, um, I will simply say that there are particular, I don't want to say because I don't want to give too much away. I will simply say that there are certain um, there are certain categories of people that are exempt from paying fees in court for filing. There are a few there are a few statute there are a few statutes and there are a few statutes on the book which if you want to sue you do not have to pay any fees. So you don't have to pay the fee to file in district court. You don't have to pay the fee in court of appeals. You don't have to pay the fee Supreme Court. You don't have to pay any fees. Congress excluded excluded fees. So without without saying what it is, I will simply say that my client falls into that category, and because they fall into that category, they don't also have to comply with the standard printing rules. So that's nice. I'll probably have it printed at a print shop, you know, or something. I'll just probably have it printed at a professional print shop. But yeah. Yeah, until it's actually filed. I don't want to I don't want to say more than I have to. I I don't know why it's 40 I don't know why it's 40 copies. I still don't know why it's 40 copies. I guess one for every justice and how many clerks do they have? So one for every clerk. Maybe it is. Mm. All right, I'm going to sign off for now. You guys have been fun. Till later, friends. Cheers. Goodbye.